everyone. Welcome to the newest episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. It's actually the first episode of 2022, so thank you for joining me starting off the new year right. Today, we have an incredibly talented indie rock singer-songwriter based in Los Angeles, California. She has a new single out right now called A Hit of You, A Bit of You, out now on all streaming platforms. Before we get the episode started, please make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And do not forget to follow me at Parker Whirling and at on that note underscore podcast on Instagram. And on that note, please welcome Halo Kitsch. I'm sitting here with Halo Kitsch, an indie rock singer-songwriter from Los Angeles, California. Thank you for joining me for an episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. It's actually the first episode of 2022, which is very exciting. So excited to bring you uh, with me into the new year here. I usually like to start off my podcasts with asking about the writing and recording process behind your newest song, which for you is a hit of you, a bit of you, which I discovered on Spotify's Fresh Finds Indie Playlist. And it's such a bop. I recommend that everybody go check it out as soon as they can. Um, But I would love to actually start talking about um, some questions I had after reading an interview that you did with Euphoria Magazine, which I think came out in 2020. And uh, you just had a couple quotes in there that I thought were really interesting and really hit the vibe of the things we like to talk about on this show for uh, inspired artists. And uh, one of the first things you said, sorry if we're kind of getting right into it, right into the meat of it, uh, but you said, I was scared of failing and scared of succeeding. And you were mainly talking about just getting into music and i think you know we typically understand the idea of being scared to fail i think most people typically can grasp that idea but it's interesting that you also said you mentioned that you had a failure of succeeding and there is a certain fear that comes with getting what you want that it won't be what you expected or it won't be enough Uh, did you go through any experiences where you succeeded in something regarding art, your music, and then you realized maybe it was different than you expected. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that so much came from like a particular experience or if a, if I'd sort of built up this fear in my head, um, like by imagining what, success would feel like um I think every single time I felt like a little pat on the back for you know validation or recognition or good work on this song um I want more (laughs) I'm one of those people I'm like the like uh have you read the book the molecule of more no that sounds cool though it's an interesting book where it's like human nature is to crave like like the idea that nothing's enough. I remember in high school, I had this fear that like, I had, it was kind of, it was kind of a ridiculous fear, bear with me, but I had this fear that I was going to live like a very average life and that I would be content, but not joyous. And that fear kind of like followed me with anything. Um, When I went to college, I knew I wanted to be making music, but I was scared that if I'd been making music, I would regret not having a degree, (laughs) you know? Um, And I've actually heard it's more common than people would think. Like, I listened to an interview with Taylor Swift, and she was describing, like, her inspiration from The Lucky One, from Red, and, like, that whole song is about what she was afraid it would be like to make it to the top. And um, she also said that it wasn't, that wasn't how it, how it is you know like she doesn't have the same fears that she did when she was um starting off and that it turned out differently so I think that I just it's interesting because when you read that when you read that to me when you said it just now I sort of got chills I do still have the fear of like what if nothing's enough um or what if I you know am touring 
some crazy big show and I would rather be at home with like a family. (laughs) I still have like that crazy fear, but I think it's just kind of like human doubt and the grass is always greener and um, like a fear of loneliness down to the core of it or... Yeah, I mean, it's also it's also the same thing that drives me to keep going. It's like when I get a pat on the back for, hey, good song, or you got playlisted, and I want to do more, that's the thing that keeps me going. Or like when somebody DMs me like, hey, I related to your song, I'm like, okay, let's go for two people on the next song, let's go for three people on the next song. So it's tricky because um, fear can be used as either a motivator or like to paralyze you. And, and it's been hard for me to navigate like in which ways to um, access like that feeling of like, not to let it petrify me, but to keep moving through it. Yeah, it, fear is such a weird thing. And really, it seems like all you can do is use it to the best of your ability because it can be such a thing that drags you down and drags most people down. But it seems like maybe the worst thing you can do is pretend like you're not scared of that thing when it might be a little bit more fruitful to acknowledge that thing and maybe dive headfirst into it, which for artists, I mean, it's a lot of things are scary about being an artist, uh, getting in front of people and performing, uh, burying your soul in the studio or even writing by yourself. And you have to acknowledge some feelings that come up while you're writing. Like your songs are very personal, which I would imagine some people are pretty comfortable being really honest with themselves, but I personally, and I know a lot of other people that it's hard to really be honest with yourself while you're writing. Do you feel like it's harder for you to be in tune with yourself when you're writing or is it a little bit easier? Is it harder to express that with other people? What's your typical situation when it comes to maybe the emotional side of creating? interesting um i like your questions thanks wait thanks for listening to a hit of you a bit of you and also thanks for going as far back to read into an interview because that's kind of cool um okay i think like the piano is my safe space and like my writing is kind of my safe space so i tend to like go overboard there um with personal details and blah 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 the gory details and then i'll get into the studio with ben and i'll be like like, for example, Do You Feel Like a Sinner Yet? On that song, we I wrote it really fast and he produced it pretty quickly. So it all felt like it was still happening in my life, like at the t- same time that it was released, um, which was weird because a lot of the songs I wrote a couple years ago, so they feel kind of past tense to me and that one didn't. Um, but I got into the studio and I said, I don't know how I feel about saying I play fake friends at recess because like, people are going to hear that and think that I was a two-faced bitch. Sorry, a two-faced... I don't know. What's the temperature on cussing? You can cuss. You can totally cuss. <laughs> no big deal. It is not exactly the a family-friendly podcast. It's all good. Perfect. I'm not a family-friendly person. Um, <laughs> I, I was afraid of like saying that because the people that I was referring to were still so present in my life. And he kind of is the judge of like... He'll say, no, if it makes you uncomfortable put it in we're keeping that one whereas um like I've explored a few topics of like what it was like to meet my biological father and that's a more sensitive relationship so we've been more careful there with like um how to put it or whether or not to include it so I think in another way like it's judgment I have his help um But I would say that I'm more honest at the piano because I tend to put off this, like, very tough chick, don't mess with me, I'm aware. You know, I, for a long time in my life, I was really um, on inside pain and it showed on the outside. And I only put that inside pain into the music. So you wouldn't know, looking at me, that I gave a shit about anything. And then I'd sing a song called Flawless. You've heard, you've seen, I'd sing Flawless and you're like, whoa, <laughs> she feels, you know? <laughs> so like, it's been a weird like way to balance um, kind of, I think social media makes it hard and the world that we're in makes it hard. You don't want to offend anybody, but 
definitely it's been kind of interesting to figure out like the opacity I guess of um my representation like I've tried to be really transparent about my songwriting process and about my inspiration and about the relationships that I went through to like get a song out of them I've tried to be really transparent to anybody who's asked um which is new to me because I used to wear all black and smoke a lot of cigarettes you know and then I'd like (laughs) get squishy in my song (laughs) yeah well, that's funny that you bring up Flawless because my next uh, section I wanted to get into was a quote that you said in that Euphoria magazine about your song Flawless. You said, there's no beauty or satisfaction in being well received for what you aren't. And I thought that was a beautiful quote and a hard lesson for a lot of artists, uh, including me, to really soak in because when you're putting out your own music or, I mean, it could be anything. It could be painting. It could be even just public public speaking. You want to be perceived as a certain person, right? You want to be perceived well. You want to be well-liked. But it can be really hard to to accept yourself and accept your flaws and accept the things that make you make up yourself that aren't things maybe you're proud of. Uh, was there a time where you felt like maybe you weren't being your truest self in your art and you had to, uh, like, what was that realization like if that happened? Uh, do you still have moments of self-consciousness? How do you navigate that part of your life when it comes to uh, writing and putting out lyrics that you feel like represent you? Congrats to me for not laughing at what sounded like public spanking. I know. It's, I like said it. Maybe it was like some weird Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, wow, your questions are really good. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I'd ha- Regardless wish I'd of the, the public spanking. <laughs> flashcards. I wish I had flashcards or something to, to really give you the answer that you deserve. I think, okay. I think that, going back to the quote, like, there's no beauty or satisfaction in being well received for what you aren't. Um, there is definitely a mold there's a few different molds that seem to work for a lot of people. And I have found that it's really easy to pick one of those molds, jump in the shape, pose, and see some success come from it. Um, But I happen to know that that wouldn't fulfill me at all because I wouldn't be seen for who I am. I'd be seen for fitting into the mold and, you know, for whoever trailblazed ahead of me and created the mold. Um, I tried, you know, I struggled to get into this music industry for, for a long time. And I tried a lot of different ways, a lot of different angles. And one of the ways that I tried was, um, being a vocalist for somebody who created sort of like EDM dance music. They're really cool. They create dope music, but, um, I'd go into the room and they'd have the lyrics and the melody already planned out and I'd just have to sing it. And it felt like totally against every natural inkling that I had in my voice he didn't want because it didn't fit his vision and it I couldn't like he didn't want my vibrato which I kind of naturally do and it's like hard for me to like automate like (laughs) I just couldn't I was like I don't get how to not do it and he was like just it I wasn't the right fit and I you know maybe I'd be a good vocalist for somebody else but that was when I realized like I'm not gonna get any joy out of this like I might as well go to college um So that's when I, like, started to realize that I had to do it only for me. And that was hard because, like, watching people, like, take a shortcut um, and falling behind can be really frustrating. Um, But I think that it's worth it in the end. You know, I, I... the authenticity of like what I've been putting out is being reciprocated by the people that listen to it. 
And I think that's a really rare breed of people who are listening to my music because it's not like an easy time to take responsibility or to like say at the top of your lungs, it's my fault. That's not what our generation's like been doing or wants to do. Um, and I'm not talking about... I feel like there's obviously there's certain situations where... Well, I'm going to get myself into a pickle here. <laughs> I'm not victim blaming. I'm talking about in day to day life, not in traumatic events, but in day to day life, a lot of us um, shrug stuff off instead of take take responsibility and change our actions. And I think that the people who are listening to who are listening to Halo Kitsch are really strong people for doing that. And I think if I had um, just written a a pop song that wasn't one that I related to, I wouldn't have that same connection with my listeners. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's obvious when listening to your music that there's a lot more going on than let's pick a fun beat and and sing about going out and having fun with our friends and that's it right and yeah if that brings there's nothing wrong with that either (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and there's nothing wrong with that but i can tell like there's something very therapeutic for you about writing these feelings down because you know that other people are going to be able to relate to them in a way that's more than surface level it's almost selfish really because i would be writing with zero listeners with 10 listeners with that you know it's just a bonus that people are listening to me and it's like i write for me and then i feel less alone and it's like for me again (laughs) to feel less alone it's like it's kind of a really beautiful relationship between listeners and and myself because I'm you know on Twitter thanking everybody who's done something to support me this year and they're like no thank you and I'm like no thank you (laughs) (laughs) it's like really cute this feedback of thankfulness yeah it's like because I'll be in my DMs I've made a lot of relationships through releasing music people say I related to this song and I'm like oh shit are you okay because I wasn't when I wrote it and then we have these long conversations and it's like now I know people all over the world that feel like a community. Yeah. Well, it's really beautiful to be able to write something that feels so personal to you and have the courage and the guts to put it out. And then after you do so, not only get support just in the sense of, oh, I like this song, but also in the sense of, wow, this really helped me get through something. It's so crazy. What does it feel like to you? Like, I know in general, people, artists can experience imposter syndrome. Do you feel like, do you ever feel weird uh, when people reach out to you? Or does it really always feel, do you try to keep a sense of gratitude? No, yeah, I'm always really grateful um, when people reach out to me. And I think that's part of the reason that it works me being so honest in my songs because I don't have any imposter syndrome because I can point to like any of the lyrics and explain the story behind that lyric and so like one person reached out and said all your fault you know is my exact life and I said oh my supermarket was Trader Joe's because I have that line like uh (laughs) what's the line I'm begging you to recollect you and me in the supermarket I saw the rest of my life in a flash and she goes mine was Vaughn's (laughs) (laughs) that's funny so it's just cute to like get into the details of that and then somebody else reached out and said that their fiance like broke up with them after they had left the country and they didn't know like how to cope but like they'd gone to my music or found my music somehow and that when they say something like that deep like that helps um it does feel weird because I do write so personally that I'm like the fact that somebody else could relate to this is so crazy but it it's just more proof that like we're not alone in the universe really that's gonna sound so corny but like it's there's such a web of things that like connect us all and it's made it really easy for me to see the beauty in like other people despite like the differences and that's what it's all about right that's what it's all about being able to connect people and not divide people with our art yeah my listeners too are like when i look at my pie chart it's like a like male, female, non-binary, like, like, I've had trans people reach out, I've had, um, like, just everyone you can possibly think of, and I'm like, wow, 
look at this wide span of like humans that I just love. Like gay, straight, bi, whatever, name your shit. It's like, it. I really feel like it's special that, like, I expected it to be, like, a bunch of, like, girls, <laughs> maybe teenage girls. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, and that makes me feel so much cooler. That makes me feel really, like, united to something bigger. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to be able to say you can reach such a, a big group of humans on this world which is what we want to do and i know uh you said you gotta head out kind of soon here so uh as much as i would love to keep this conversation going i do want to take you to the last five here where i'm just going to ask you five quick questions and then we'll be done sounds good all right let's do it uh first one in the studio or playing live oh that's so hard I know, I know, it's a pickle. Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna say the studio. Did I freeze? Uh oh. Studio? You're going to say the studio? Yeah. Sorry, our connection is a little rough right now, but uh, I think you said the studio, right? Mm-hmm. So what about the studio makes you pick that? Um, well, working with Ben has been so life-changing, really. And we just have so much fun in there and like watching something come to life from like me dingling it on the freaking piano like a, you know, five year old to like see what he can create it into is like, it's literal magic to me. Mm hmm. It's amazing it's, to see. Yeah. Such a basic thing that you bring to the table bloom into something huge. Absolutely. And it's it's definitely different to see that song come to life with like four different musicians on stage and like people giving it life. It's that's a different magic too, but there's something about like that back and forth and we just have such a ball in there and we've actually started writing with my um our guitarist Sam too and it's just been so much fun. <laughs> that's amazing. I I got to agree with you about in the studio. There's something that's very special about being able to create something out of nothing. My my second question here is what do you think is a perfect album front to back? Like give me an ex give you an example? Yeah, like what do you think is a perfect album front to back? I've said it before, I'll say it again. Songs about Jane. Yeah, Maroon 5. The first one, though, everyone gives me so much shit for that. And I'm like, just listen to it. If I had to pick another one, I'd say The New Radicals. Okay. Is that They're um, first and last. Is that the one... Uh, what's the main song everybody knows? Gotta Stay High. We'll kick your asses. Don't yes. Play. Yes, oh. yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. That song is amazing. I don't know I don't any know other that. song by them. Okay, the whole album is so, really... So I their never first album, you would say, is their best? I don't think they ever album? created another one. That was it. Just one album. I'm frozen, aren't I? <laughs> that... That is a perfect album, then. <laughs> well, I'll have to go check that out. I haven't heard that one. Yes. You should li give it a listen. I will, absolutely. All right, question number three. Who is your dream artist or producer to work with? Um, I think I answer this differently every time. Today, I'm going to say Kesha. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you said you loved her in that Euphoria interview. I love her. I could absolutely see that.
working out perfectly. I went ahead and uh, wrote down three artists and producers I could definitely see you working with in the future. Who? So producer would be Mark Ronson. Oh, cool. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then the other two artists I'd love to see are uh, Harry Styles. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, and St. Vincent. Oh, cool. Love her. Yeah, yeah. All uh, very incredible artists and producers. I think I could see you gelling with all of them. Well, I'm flattered. Actually, I almost said Harry Styles. And then... Um... St. Vincent, I actually got to see her speak at a ASCAP convention, and oh, I was just so enchanted. I've been listening to her music like more so in high school, and I haven't really followed on as much, but I know she's so, so interesting. Yeah, she's a really interesting person. I don't know much about her other than uh, a good handful of her songs, but uh, she seems like very intelligent, very talented, and I, I probably should get into her more. Uh, I did like the album she put out this year, Daddy's Home. Um, but, yeah, those were three that kind of struck me as artists that I could see you really getting along with and making some cool music with. I'm flattered uh, by Question this. number four, though. Yeah, yeah. Question number four is going to be, what's your musical rotation right now? Oh, okay, wait. I got a second to plug. If you go on my Spotify page, I have a playlist with all of my friends on it, basically. All my up and coming, people that I know, people that I don't know, but most people are under like a million listeners. Um, and I tend to stick to like those 40-ish songs that are usually my rotation. I kind of update it often. And um, there's Tessa Ray, there's Cowboy Mugshot, there's Sunrose Band, there's Chelsea. Um, yeah, I keep it close to home. That's awesome. I love when people's musical rotations are their close friends. I like when I can text somebody and be like, yo, I'm listening to Dance, 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 and I love it. <laughs> it's like, I think that's, I'm all about community and like having that, fostering that is like important to me. I agree. I think it's a reason why I wanted to start this podcast because I get to meet so many uh, talented and, and, uh, intelligent and kind artists like you and everyone else I've interviewed and it creates this little community and it's just such a, a beautiful feeling to feel close to people that you really admire and respect. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well last question here before we're off is Halo Kitsch, what is your favorite decade of music? Oh gosh. Hmm. I'm just, I'm going to say, I'm going to say 90s. 90s, okay. Mm -hmm. I can see it. The New Radicals is right there. Mm -hmm. It's a little more alt than 80s. Yeah. That's I, wasn't, what, yeah. I wasn't sure if you were going to say that or early 2000s. That was uh, the one I was going to guess. I'm straddling them. <laughs> Yeah. Got one foot in each. <laughs> you could even say 95 to 2005. That's technically a decade, you know. Hey, give it to me. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> there you go. I've had people be like, uh, 68 to 78. I'm like, all right, well, that's very specific. I kind of applaud you for that. That's impressive. <laughs> right? But, no, that's a great answer. I, I always love... Uh, I do prefer technically, if I had to say anything, it'd be 2010s, maybe just because I really got into music then. And I think for a lot mm. of people, the the decade they typically pick is when they really started getting invested in music and started maybe uh, either making their own or just really started caring about music, which I think is interesting. That is interesting because I was zero in 1995. <laughs> I was just yeah, kidding. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so was I. That's funny. <laughs> but sometimes you just really connect with a certain era, even if you're, if you know, you weren't born in it. I'm like thoroughly convinced that I've got, you know, a treble clef in my DNA or something because my 
dad makes music and I was like my fingers weren't even big enough when I was hitting a piano for the first time so I think it's just in there sometimes and in my case yes it's very possible I think sometimes you're just born with it and uh, you can't fight it even if you want to I tried <laughs> <laughs> and look where you are now you didn't I you lost. didn't yeah. <laughs> And thank God, because now you're creating some amazing music like A Hit of You, A Bit of You, which everybody needs to go check out, your newest single, uh, Spotify, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, all of the, all of the uh, streaming services. Thank you for uh, joining me for an episode of On That Note, Halo Kitsch. I appreciate you coming on and discussing your creative process and getting down to the nitty gritty of what it is to be an artist and the feelings we go through. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry that I have to cut it short. If you ever want to do it again sometime, I'll make, more time. I'll make a bigger window. And I'm sorry, my dog's barking a little in the background. That might be hard for you to edit. But No, it's all um, good. It's all good. No, I really respected the whole way you set that up. And the questions were really cool and original and new. And I haven't gotten to share a lot of those answers before. So thank you for having me. That was cool. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I That's the kind of stuff I really want to talk to with artists about. So I'm glad that you were up for it. You were up to come on the show. And I know that everybody listening is going to appreciate, uh, you know, you being honest about your experiences because that's, that's really what I want to set up here. So thank you again. My pleasure. Awesome. Hey, Lokich, I'll talk to you later. Have a great day. You too. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you again for joining me for another episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. If you haven't yet, please make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts, and you can even leave a comment down below to let me know who you're listening to. On that note, I'll see you guys next time.